This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Wait until all these people have gone home, go out and have a good old fiddle. <laughs> what could this possibly mean? Now, it could actually mean lots of different things. So imagine, for example, I've just met a very sh keen but shy violinist at a party. <laughs> he said, wait until all these people have gone out and I'll get her out and have a good old fiddle. But it means something very different if somebody says it at, say, a funeral. Thanks a few moments, right? Now, credit for students is not my joke. This comes from uh, a BBC Radio 4 uh, series, satirical series about the evolution of humans and the human mind. If you haven't looked at it, you can get to see the CD, which is, I'm not sure it shows my age, but uh, get, a, get a recording. It's very funny. Uh, obviously, lots of satire, lots of silliness, but also a few uh, kernels of real truth about uh, the evolution of the human mind. One bit in particular is about the evolution of language and communication, that's where this joke comes from. And the point that Chris Addison is going across in that is that there is always this difference between what is said and what is meant. The technical term, the jargon from philosophy, is underdeterminacy. What is said underdetermines what is meant. And in many respects, Sarah touched on many examples of exactly this point. Now, underdeterminacy is sometimes, for some people, seen as a, a, a problem, uh, an imperfection, uh, something that's kind of suboptimal about human communication. I'm not sure that's true. I think, in many respects, it's actually an asset. It gives us a lot of flexibility and creativity, and that's a point I'm going to come back to later. Uh, and I, guess, I guess I'm going to come back to that in the third part of this talk. So there are three, three topics I want to touch on. First, I'm going to talk about what makes human communication quite distinctive across the natural world. Uh, and then, second, I'm going to talk about well, where, that, where languages fit into that picture. So the first part of the talk is, well, I'm going to, language is going to pop up. It's more about communication itself. Languages in the second part, that's a bit shorter. And then in the third part, a few observations about how we use communication, uh, the diverse ways in which we use communication. I'm going to talk in particular about artistic expression and where that fits into the bigger picture. Okay, so communication. When we thought, well, what is communication? How can it work, even in principle? And the intuitive answer goes, in the cognitive science of communication, it goes by the name of the code model. It's a very intuitive idea. A couple of images here which kind of capture it nicely. There's a couple of parts to the code model. So one is called the conduit metaphor. So a conduit is a channel for sending things along. And uh, this conduit metaphor is here. We have this message, we package it up in some way, send it along, and we unwrap it at the other end. This is so intuitive, <coughs> it's all over our like, everyday language. Send me your ideas, get your message across. We use the metaphor of the conduit all the time. This is from uh, Shannon's work on information theory, the beginnings of information theory, just after the. <coughs> this is a diagram that Shannon drew, or a version of the diagram Shannon drew. And, uh, well, the idea is that there's sort of some information which is then encoded in an algorithm, sent along the communication channel, perhaps with some noise uh, in there, and then decoding algorithm, which deals with that noise and, and, and unravels the message. And if this encoding algorithm and the decoding algorithm are appropriately calibrated to one another, then in theory what goes in at one end should be the same as what comes out at the other. So, as I say, this is a very intuitive way of thinking about human communication. There is, however, well, a long uh, history of thought in the philosophy of language which says, well, yeah, that's how maybe that's how computers communicate, arguably it's how most animals communicate. But human linguistic communication in particular cannot be reduced just to codes. In many respects, you can read Wittgenstein's arguing, parts of Wittgenstein's arguing that. And this argument is most closely associated with people like Paul Grice, John Searle, Austin, philosophers of language of the middle of the 20th century. A few examples here from the trivial to uh, slightly more uh, enlightening. 
take her to the bank, well, which bank? So it could be the financial institution, it could be the side of the river bank, the side of the river. I want that, so that is a technical term in linguistics, a didactic word, it points to things, and exactly what it points to depends on the context of what is currently the topic of conversation. What is that? Animal here, well, this could mean look at the nice fluffy bunny rabbit, but it could also mean I really don't like your table manners. It could mean, you know, uh, um, I, I want this pet dog, or it could mean all sorts of things. And in fact, when you start to list the possible number of speaker meanings that could be behind an utterance like this, well, you can't do it. You, however long your list, there's always something else that you can add to that list. The last example is a little interchange between Bob and Mary. Bob asked Mary if she'd like to join uh, us for dinner. Mary says she ate earlier. Well, here's the thing about what she says. She doesn't actually answer Bob's question. Just on its own, the words themselves on their own, do not answer Bob's question. So there's something more going on than just coding and decoding. It's a point that Sarah made uh, at length and eloquently in her talk. So what is it? Sarah made a plea for, you know, well, what is going on, right? Um, and in some respects, I regret not uh, <coughs> directing my talk in that direction now, but uh, I, I'm only going to touch on this uh, aspect of the, uh, of the issue. <coughs> And I guess the key thing to get across is that human communication, unlike the code model, there's a qualitative difference in human communication, and that is that it's all about social cognition, and more precisely, it's about expressing and recognizing intentions. So, and, and let's be more precise, it's about expressing and recognizing two types of intentions. So one of them we call an informative intention, that's what I want to communicate, it's the content. I intend that you understand some things about human communication. Now that's my informative intention. But that informative, informative intention is itself embedded in something else, which we call a communicative intention. That's my very intention, that you recognize that I want to communicate with you. Now language is not the best place to make this, to elucidate this point, so let's take something much more simple. I was in a coffee shop yesterday, I finished my cup of coffee, I wanted another one. So I looked over at the waitress, caught her eye, and I tilted my hand, my, my, my wrist, in a deliberate, exaggerated, slightly exaggerated way. And the waitress saw this, she comes over, she refills my coffee cup. Now what's the difference between you know, an incidental tilt of the wrist, which we do all the time in conversation, just through gesturing, and this more deliberate, exaggerated type? The technical term is ostension. I twisted my wrist in an ostensive way. And in so doing, I expressed that I want to communicate. And what for, and I'm, not, I'm not going to go into any detail, but what uh, cognitive scientists and philosophers of language have come to recognize is that recognizing that somebody has this intention is halfway to solving what it is they want to communicate. The informative intention is buried inside the communicative one. Announcing I'm trying to communicate with you is an important part of the core part of the evidence that the audience needs to understand what we want to get across. Okay, now I'm not going to go into a, there's a lot more can be said about that, elucidate that in a bit more detail. Maybe we'll do that in a question session. Uh, I'm going to, <coughs> what I want to, I'm just going to describe one experiment now on uh, human children. Uh, <coughs> With, uh, one experiment of many, there's many out there now, but I'm just going to describe one which uh, shows that even, human even young human children have a good understanding, a good appreciation of the fact that human communication is all about intentions. It sounds complicated when we write it all down, we flesh it out in detail, people write long <coughs> books explaining it all in detail. But even young children have an intuitive grasp of what's going on. Okay. So this comes from uh, Max Planck Institute, who I understand Matthias spent some time some years ago. Uh, and so what goes on in, what goes on in this study is uh, the variety of condition, the key contrast is these two here. The child is playing a game with the experiment, and behind the experiment is just here a bunch of toys, a horse, a piece of paper, a ball, and so on and so forth. <coughs> and things are set up such that <coughs> uh, the child is asking the experimenter for different, different toys at different and in this correct condition, the child asks the experimenter for the ball, says, and the experimenter says, oh, you want the ball? She gets the ball, she hands the child the ball. Everything is good. Okay? Fine. In the happy accident condition, the child asks for the ball, 
And the experimenter is a bit ditzy, a bit dopey, misunderstands. Oh, you want the paper? I'll give you the paper in a moment. And absentmindedly gives the child the ball. Right? So the child's material goal to get the ball is satisfied. But her, the, the child's informative goal is not satisfied. The, the adult <coughs> did not understand. So the question is, well, what does the child do here? The child's material goal, again, is satisfied. <coughs> so if the child is only concerned with that, this should be fine. But it turns out it's not. Children complain. They complain at some length, in fact. You didn't understand. I wanted the ball. Well, you got the ball. Right? So why are you complaining? The reason the child, really, the child is complaining is because infants communicate in order to be understood, they want to affect mental states, and the change in behavior follows that. This is something infants grasp even from a very young age. As I say, there's a lot more experiments that look at different aspects of these informative and communicative intentions. I'm not going to go into those now, in many respects that's a longer talk, talk another day, we can talk about that in the question session or maybe later. I want to touch briefly on the question of whether any other species communicates in this way. <coughs> now the truth is we don't know for sure. We don't, nobody has done experiments like the one I just described on chimpanzees and other non-human primates, let alone any other species. And I've, there are, I think there are two reasons why these experiments haven't, haven't been done. One of them is just it's damn difficult. So that experiment I described to you involved verbal interaction between the child and the experimenter. <laughs> so if you want to do it on chimpanzees, you need to create a non-verbal version of the experiment, and that's no trivial task at all. It's not obvious how you go about that. But there are some brilliantly creative people doing this sort of work, and they haven't tried. And when I speak to them, I've spoken to some of the, you know, the best minds when it comes to comparative cognition, the best minds out there, and they say, there's no point because the chimps aren't going to pass. <laughs> so they don't know, they haven't done the experiment. But um, you know, the, my, my reading of, of, of talking to the, to the experts in this area, they're pretty skeptical that chimps are going to pass tasks like the one just, I just described. The chimp passes for the ball and gets the ball, doesn't matter how the chimp gets the ball, the chimp's happy. So the hypothesis that I, forward, that I put forward in my book is that this form of communication, we call it ostensive communication, is uniquely human. It might not be, future evidence might overturn that, but I think that's the best reading of the data if we have it. What chimpanzees do have is some basic forms of social cognition. There's good reasons to think that chimpanzees and other non-human primates, and in fact some ravens and some other species, have basic skills of predicting uh, or rec recognizing the intentions behind behavior and thereby predicting behavior. Uh, if, you, uh, if you go to offer a chimpanzee some food and then you drop the food in one of two different ways, either accidentally or deliberately tease the chimpanzee. So one of them is an accident, one of them is deliberate. The chimpanzee complains a lot more in the deliberate situation than in the accidental situation. Suggests that the chimpanzee understands your intentions that underline that behavior. So there is some form of social cognition. And what seems to be different about humans is that social cognition has gone much further. We can start to embed intentions inside other intentions. And you take that far enough and you start to be able to express those intentions in ways where others can recognize that you have them. And there you start to see the beginnings of ostensive communication. So for me, the difference between humans and non-human primates and other species is our communication is really fundamentally a form of social cognition, and it's one where we help each other express intentions and recognize them. It's mutually assisted <coughs> Okay, so that's communication. Where does the language <coughs> fit in? Communi the communication I've talked about so far is more basic than language. It can involve tilting a coffee cup, it can involve shrugging or grunting, screaming. <laughs> Languages are a tool that we plug on top of this, make it super powerful. Languages are sets of conventions which make human communication much more expressive, more powerful than it otherwise would be. So with points and shrugs and the like, I can point to things here in this room now. With language, I can point to things that are remote in time and space. I can point to things that don't even exist. I can invent stories. 
And I can do that because we've collectively, as a community, agreed on a set of conventions. Dog refers to canine animals, not to feline animals, for example. But we could use any word. So that language is a, something we plug on top of our basic ostensive communication. We make it much more flexible and more powerful as a result. Now, over the next few slides, I'm going to just show you a couple of studies from a literature, a bird, a growth, fast growing literature now, on how humans create these conventional systems. I don't want to spend too long on this, but it's not the heart of the talk. But I just want to get across the point that people are now starting to study the creation of these sets of conventions. So you have this basic form of communication, ostensive, ostensive communication. On top of that, you put conventions, and you can look at how people start to create them. So you get two people into a laboratory, and you play, essentially, you get them to play Pictionary with one another in a slightly more controlled form. So you give them a list of concepts, of, of meanings to get across, 24 of them in this case, one of which is cartoon, that's going to be the correct answer. And one of them is drawing this, and the other one needs to say, stop, I know what it is. And that's what the first person draws, and that was enough for their partner to guess that they meant cartoon and not one of the other 24 concepts. Second time they swap roles, they play again, and this time this comes out, it's a little smaller, it's, um, but it still looks a bit like a cartoon. But then they repeat this over and over, and the iconicity starts to vanish pretty quickly. Just a few rounds of interaction back and forth, and we start to get to something like this. I'm prepared to bet you play this just a few more, you just get an M shape, basically, which would come to mean cartoon. But M's have nothing to do with cartoons, more to do with hamburgers, frankly. Um, Okay, so now, time, and just, just to make the point graphic, time for a tiny bit of audience participation. So this is from a totally similar experiment. 24 concepts given to people, down here on the right. This is generation six, so they've interacted, they've swapped roles five times up to now. And now one of them draws this, and the other one is able to guess which of these 24 concepts it is. Anyone want to take a guess? Can you read this? Everyone says toothbrush, but it's not a toothbrush. Well, everyone says toothbrush, but that is not the right answer. Uh, uh, poverty. Sorry? Poverty. Not poverty. Wow. Uh, no. Russell Crowe. No. Theatre. Theatre is the right answer, and here's how. Yeah. So you see the history, and it becomes obvious, right? But it's not intuitive at first. Is that was my flaw there, that boundary. Right. Yeah. Most yeah. people don't see it. I'm writing about that at the moment. So. <laughs> and what we're seeing here in the laboratory, just in a few interactions, it happens very quickly. People, and what, what people are creating here is a key defining feature, or not defining, a distinctive feature of language, which is arbitrary symbolism. As I said earlier, dog could use different words. <coughs> dog to refer to canine animals. This is a symbol too. This doesn't really look like but people are using it and understanding it. And what we're seeing here is also, incidentally, reflected in the history of writing systems. It's my embarrassment that I haven't actually checked up which is right, which writing, I should know that took this from a paper, but um, which writing systems they are. But you can see clearly, this looks something like a gate. This has an iconic quality to it. You get over here, this doesn't look at all like a gate. Right? Uh, we see this in writing systems. We also see people creating it in real time in the laboratory. Other experiments are looking at the emergence of grammar and syntax and rules about combining words together. I'm not going to go into that in detail now. What I want to get across is that these sets of conventions are tools that we create. We create them quickly, easily, uh, in interaction. And combined with what I was saying earlier, you get, I get the thesis that this is the subtitle of my book. And here's the thesis. Human communication is this distinctive thing, ostensive communication fundamentally a type of social cognition, really, about expressing and recognizing intentions. And then on top of that, we create languages, and those languages evolve culturally to develop the distinctive features that we associate with them that we call linguistic. OK. So let me summarize. So uh, I'm going to move on to a slight, move on to the more speculative or suggestive part of the talk now. And I'm going to talk in particular about the, the diversity of and the flexibility of human communication, linguistic or otherwise, the way it can be used for lots of different means of expression. Words are, as I say, a very powerful tool, but also quite indirect. 
And they're symbolic, that's the point. Right? It makes them a little bit remote, and that's something I want to expand on a bit now. Uh, and this is work that, well, a lot of what I've been saying builds on work by um, a pair of what, linguists, cognitive scientists, philosophers of language, Deirdre Wilson and Dan Sperber, and also I should give credit to Robert Carston, who's in the audience, who's uh, developed these ideas um, further. And this is, uh, these are some new ideas from, from this school of thought, and I think they're very relevant to the topics of today's, uh, today's workshop. So two continue in human communication. So one is between things that are formal, determinate, exact, we can express them as propositions. You ask somebody what time the next train is, this is more or less a logical statement of a proposition. But sometimes what we want to say is we want to create an impression, we want to suggest some interpretations. But we're not the, exactly what those interpretations are, we're leaving relatively open. <coughs> Much more precise over here. A metaphor and hyperbole, all, almost all human communication is actually somewhere in between. Metaphor and hyperbole is, is a good example in the middle. So there's one continuum between the determinate, the exact, and the indeterminate, the uh, suggestive, uh, creating an impression. And another continuum we have between showing and meaning. The distinction between showing and meaning is historically a big topic in the philosophy of language. I think it's better to think of them as on, on a continuum. So, if my partner is taking a lot of time getting ready, I can literally show her that we're going to miss the train. I can show her, I could tell her, but I would be indirect with words, but I can show her my watch. It is literally 10 past 10 already. And this, is, this is more direct. It's a famous thought experiment in the philosophy of language about holding up the head of somebody to show that they're dead. You literally show because the, the, the head is here without the body. <laughs> just to be clear, this person said, I'm showing you that. I'm not just saying it, I'm not just meaning it, I'm just meaning it, I'm showing it. But of course, most uh, well, linguistic communication is about meaning. The point of words is that they're indirect, they're symbols, they stand in for something else. That's the whole point. The example I gave you earlier of the coffee cup is in some respects in between. You could say I'm showing, if, let's say I'm holding a coffee cup, you could say that I'm showing the waitress that it's empty because I've been tilted and no coffee is coming out. But it also has a quasi-conventional dimension to it too, right? So it sits somewhere in between. And it's interesting when both these continue actually to look at specific cases and compare examples and start to map out where they sit on this continuum. What's particularly interesting is to put them together on, a, on two dimensions. And we can say we take specific cases and plot them where, where they might fit on here. And let's just take three of the ones I've just been looking at so far. Juliet is this sun. This is indirect. It's using words, symbols, standing in for things. And it's trying to get across something which is suggestive, indeterminate. It's creating an impression. The next train is at 12.48, it's determinate, it's formal, it's logical, propositional. Um, and again, it's using uh, symbols, it's stand, using things that stand in for something else. It's meaning. It's what we are going to, we are literally going to miss the train, is more or less determinate, but I'm actually showing it. Maybe that should actually be a little bit higher. But it's roughly in that, somewhere in that corner. It's the question, what goes in the bottom left corner? What, what could possibly go here? What I want to say, I mean, well, before I answer that question, it's worth saying, if the people who think that languages are just codes, languages are just these formal codes, ambiguity and imprecision is a defect, dictionaries tell us the rules, etc., etc., then all, all linguistic communication belongs up here. I just don't think that's right. It's much more diverse than that. In fact, all human communication. There's a whole bunch of things down here, they're not linguistic, but artistic expression. I'm going to illustrate with them. Um, painting, but the point's applied to other forms of artistic expression too, such as literature and others. This Edward Hopper, mid-century uh, real American realist painter, this is his most famous work, I'm sure you're familiar with it, Night Hawks, and uh, Hopper, if you look at a lot of his work, a common theme is isolation, uh, loneliness, themes of that sort. Hopper once said, if you could say it in words, there would be no reason to paint. 
I read this as saying, look, if I could, I'm using this because I want to show you, I don't want to mean it, I don't want to hold it indirect, I want to show you loneliness and isolation. But I don't want to create the impression, I don't have a formal propositional thing I want to say, I'm going to go back a slide. Uh, I want, to, I want to create this impression, but I want to make it more visceral and more real by showing you it. Languages just aren't that well suited for that end. And that's why I'm going to paint. This is a multiform, one of Mark Rothko. You can see lots of Rothko in the tape just down the road, as I'm sure you know. Rothko himself said, a painting is not a picture of an experience, it is an experience. He's saying it's not something that stands in for, like words do and other symbols. It doesn't stand in for the experience. It's not indirect. It's direct. He's showing you this is the experience. Engaging with the other is the experience. Both of these artists are in their own way trying to get across the idea that what they're doing is communicating. But what what they want to do is communicate in this way down here. They want to be direct, visceral, real. This is what it is like. But what the thing that they're trying to get across is, is, is this impression. When I say Juliet is the sun, I'm giving you an impression of what Juliet is like to me. But I'm doing it indirectly. These artists are trying to do it more directly, more viscerally, more real. They're trying to show you. They're doing the equivalent of holding up the head without the body. Okay, so let me summarize. Human communication, we, we look at language and we think, well, maybe we can reduce all of this to, to code model thinking. Algorithms much like those that work on computers. I don't think that's true. It's really a form of social cognition. It's expressing and recognizing intentions. And we do this in all sorts of ways, which language is, linguistic communication is just one. It's a very special, the most important case, really. But it is still, nevertheless, just one case of expressing and recognizing intentions. And what makes it special is that there's this whole sets of conventions that make it more flexible, more powerful, more quick, more easy than other forms. But those other forms are important too, and artistic expression is one. And it's important because it can do things, it's well suited to things that languages aren't well suited to. We choose different means of expression depending on our ends. Some better for others, some better than others for given our different ends. And I think that's probably a good point for me to stop.